Thank you, Teresa. And it looks to me like uh, nearly everybody's in. I can see some uh, old faces, but I also see lots of new faces. So it's always nice to have new people coming into the Container Solutions webinars. So welcome. My name is Jamie Dobson. Uh, I'm the founder of Container Solutions, but I'm still very actively engaged in our community work and our client work. And my interests lie in strategy, in leadership uh, and things like that. During September, so as many of you, well, it's, <laughs> I was going to say, of course, you are all aware that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And therefore, in June and July and August, we really had a difficult time at work uh, with pe you know, people's relatives being sick and uh, loss of money a loss of cohesion. So it's been an extremely stressful time for many people in our society. And, you know, that includes the people at Container Solutions. So in September, we wanted to write about resilience. We had a theme. We talked about systems resilience, uh, but we also talked about organizational resilience and psychological resilience. My contribution to the, the theme of September was a blog that, was, that came out yesterday and this talk, which is about resilient leadership. Uh, and so that's why we're all here today. Now, one of the pieces of feedback I got last week was, what's this got to do with cloud native? So I'm going to address that piece of feedback right at the beginning of the webinar because there is a link, right? And it's not completely uh, disconnected, but so I will explain that. A couple of things, a couple of small announcements. Now I wasn't going to do this. I didn't want to show off too much, but uh, we have just appeared in Forbes magazine. So I'll copy the link and I'll put it in the chat box. And this is because of our work into green uh, energy and uh, data centers that are powered by 100% renewable energy. In the background for the last two years, we've been chipping away at this, creating coherent strategies for ourselves, and we've been trying to apply pressure to Amazon. So this is not about CS. This is not, this is not about us trying to sell you anything. It's about trying to influence uh, uh, the future of public cloud and making sure that all new public clouds powered by renewable energy. So actually I will ask, I won't do this myself because I'm probably going to switch Zoom off by accident. I will ask Teresa to drop that into the chat box whenever she's got a moment. Uh, any, if anybody's interested in that, please take a read. Okay, back to my main, my main deck. Is that, can you all see that now and you can hear me? It should, you should see a picture of Theodore Roosevelt uh, and a title called Resilient Leadership. Can I get a thumbs up? Absolutely. You can all oh, see good. that, fantastic. Okay, so before we go, we are also launching a new concept. It's called WTF Cloud Native. So it turns out that nobody actually knows what Cloud Native means. And then when we asked our, our friends, what, what does it mean? We get about 100 answers. So as of uh, October, we're going to be talking every single week about WTF Cloud Native. The next big session I will be personally involved in is with Matt Skelton. He wrote the book Team Topologies. I think I've got it here, actually. Uh, Matt wrote this really famous book. Uh, I'm very jealous because I've got five reviews of my book on Amazon and he's got about 500 reviews. Matt will be coming to talk about platform. So put that in your agenda. As part of the same, oops, oh, what have I done? Oh, I clicked the link. Oh yeah, that link's, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, am I still in full screen? Yeah, as part of that uh, 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 series of content, We'll also be actually addressing what is cloud native and why should I care? So please feel free to sign up for those. Those are coming up. They're all free. Uh, they're all community based. Uh, uh, and it'd be good to keep the discussion going. I'm just, I'm, I'm having a bit of a, come on, come on, you can do it. Yes. And then next announcement, honestly, I'm finished. This is the last one. Software Circus is a community event that we run. It's completely free. If anybody sponsored it, we might make money, but nobody ever does. So there's no money to be made from this. And on the odd occasion that we have more sponsorship money than our costs, it goes straight back into the community. Please come along. If you want to speak, put it in the chat box. The CFP closed yesterday, but we might be able to make an exception. This is a really cool event, 100% fancy dress. And it's about horror stories, things that have gone wrong and how we bounce back from them and how we dealt with the shame and the disappointment and all of that. Halloween special in a few weeks. Okay, no more announcements. Um, so the problem with making these things hyperlinks is every time I click next slide, it links to the, uh, it links to, the, it opens up a tab. So next time I think we won't, we won't hyperlink them. Okay, resilient leadership. What on earth are we gonna be speaking about? Well, I am personally very much interested in politics and the 
and leadership at scale and the leadership of you know people right and of course all leadership involves people so i'm really interested in churchill and recently i've been doing a lot of reading and studying of the american presidents and i've actually pulled out three case studies that i think show really good examples of resilience and often what we call post-traumatic growth so the growth of the person after they've been shaken up by an event a tragedy or a crisis i'd like to step back from the historical examples and then focus on resilience in context what does it mean in the wider landscape of leadership because obviously resilience is important but it's only one component of leadership and by sharing a model that we use at container solutions i'm hoping to transfer a bit of knowledge there and then of course the ultimate question can we become more resilient is there any hope for us normal mortals uh, who are busy with cloud and build automation and doing agile things uh, and actually the good news is yes there's lots of things we can do to become more resilient to prepare uh, for the next crisis whenever it comes and actually to make the most out of this crisis that we're currently in so if there are no more questions or just sticky questions in the chat box and Teresa will manage that we're going to get started so in our book cloud native transformation patterns there was a character called jenny jenny was the amalgamation of all of the different customers we've helped and some of our friends who we just observed uh, she had a boss steve he wanted to get time to value and all the cool stuff from uh, uh, cloud native and the engineers uh, also wanted to get quick time to value but they wanted to play with kubernetes uh, containers uh, and all the cool stuff that comes with the cloud native tech stack now, poor Jenny had uh, a, a series of shocking incidences. I think it's fair to call them traumas. So when we help customers become cloud native, it can be extremely traumatic. And it's for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is all the heuristics and, and so-called tips and tricks of the last 10 years, they kind of go out the window because in the context of large scale distributed system development, which is what cloud native is, a lot of your heuristics don't work. Also, the thing you built, the big monolith that's stuck in your data center in a bunker that's about to be broken up and put onto a public cloud as they close the data center down, this will, this will trigger feelings of loss. It will make you think, wow, what have we been doing for the last decades? It is traumatic. Change is traumatic. And there is no bigger change than for an organization to move towards cloud native. So what happened in our book? What happened in the story? Well. The typical way we tell this is the first thing that Jenny and her team did was get it wrong. They just thought cloud native was containerize a few things, uh, uh, get your credit card out and get up on Amazon. Yeah, that's not what cloud native is. And this led to the first shock. This was at attempt one. Now at attempt two, Jenny, another classic mistake, uh, takes all of her best people, puts them into the cloud native work stream, the cloud native stuff starts to uh, move forward, but business as usual grinds to a halt. No features are coming out, no releases are coming out, we're not fixing bugs. And eventually Jenny gets it right on the third attempt. And the magic trick is she hasn't really gone cloud native, but they've created a system of innovation where proficient work uh, and creative work is in balance. Now, what we don't talk about is the psychological journey that Je Jenny went under. Because what happened was, is through a series of traumas, she became stronger, more empathic, and actually a much better leader. So it would be a crazy way to develop your leadership skills, but if you're a large company and you want to shake out the best of your people, give them something traumatic like a cloud native transformation. And it's exactly that psychological transformation I want to talk about today. But I'm not gonna talk about Jenny, I'm gonna talk about some of our uh, some of the famous presidents of the United States. So, who? Uh, I'm going to, ah, I've got myself confused. We are going to talk about the presidents. <laughs> Move it, just stepping back from Jenny. What happened to her? What did the transformation did show? It sh she, she showed that she had good stress management. She had a support network and she had cognitive resources, the ability to reframe problems, to experiment. This is, for the sake of this webinar, our working definition of resilience, right? And what we're gonna see is these characteristics pop up in these leadership stories, 
And then at the end, we can bring them all together to look at a more coherent definition of what resilience is and what resilient leadership is. So let's start with Abraham Lincoln. So the story begins for, uh, well, this, our story begins in 1855. So back in 1855, Lincoln was running uh, to become the senator for Illinois. Now, back then, it wasn't a public vote. The public didn't vote for who their senator would be, but rather the state legislature, legislature did. Within the legislature, there were 100 different assemblymen. When the voting began, Lincoln was the clear favourite of 47 different candidates. He was the choice of the so-called anti-Nebraska Whigs. Now, the anti-Nebraska Whigs were the people, or the Whig party, that did not want to see the expansion of slavery into the new Western territories. The Democrats at the time, led by Stephen Douglas, they did want to see the expansion of slavery into the Western states. Now, there was a slight problem. Despite the fact that Lincoln had the majority of people, uh, the majority of the support, the balance of power was held by somebody called Lyndon Trumbull. Trumbull was an anti-slavery Democrat and he was part of a breakaway faction. So unbelievably, the balance of power hung on one person who only had the support of his fellow breakaway Democrats and there were only five of them. Unfortunately, this led to deadlock. Now, as the evening progressed and Lincoln realized that uh, a deadlock was emerging, he instructed his supporters to change for Trumbull. By doing so, he put an anti-slavery Democrat into the Senate. The historian Doris Kearns Goodwin described this as a clear cut surrender of personal ambition to moral principle. We can view that as putting the group's needs ahead of Lincoln's own ambitions. This gives great insights into leadership and into Lincoln's characteristics. Okay, we now fast forward three years later, Lincoln is at it again, trying to run to become the Senator for Illinois. Now, he is no longer a Whig, but he's actually a Republican. This was the exact moment the Republican party formed and it formed on an anti-slavery ticket. So it was a coalition of anti-Nebraska Whigs and anti-slavery Democrats. Hundreds of people remembered his generosity from earlier and they stood by to help him. He won the popular vote. He was by far the best candidate. Uh, unfortunately, because of a reapportionment scheme, this means there are areas within uh, 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 Illinois that had a larger proportion of the say, he actually lost. However, it was during the 1958 Senate race that he came head to head against Stephen Douglas. This was the very first time Lincoln deployed his very famous rhetorical tool of a house divided. The Senate race was observed by the national press. So Lincoln, for the very first time in his career, a relatively unknown politician, was actually able to address a hugely uh, broad uh, um, uh, population. He was basically thrust to the national stage. Just to give you an idea of what a reapportionment scheme is, because I know a lot of engineers come into these talks. This is the current population of California. It's 40 million people. This is the current population of Wyoming. That's the second uh, uh, box, just over half a million. Both Wyoming and California have got two seats in the Senate. Some would argue this is unfair. It was exactly because of this reapportionment scheme back in Illinois in 58, 1858, that Lincoln, despite having the majority of votes, had lost the uh, nomination. Quite unbelievably, unbelievably, in my opinion, within the first 24 hours of what was clearly an unfair uh, uh, situation, in a reversal of roles, Lincoln was writing letters to his supporters. They were not sending him cards. Oh, never mind, better luck next time. He was writing to them. Don't worry, he said. We will soon feel better and another blow is coming. We will have fun again. I find that unbelievable. Within 24 hours, he was reframing this as a positive, as a chance to uh, um, um, grow, 
a chance to learn, and he was extremely grateful for the chance he had to speak to a wider audience. So if we start to unpack these two failures, then we start to get a real glimpse into both uh, uh, Lincoln's leadership and his resilience. The first thing to focus on is a, is a combination of his empathy, his rhetorical skills, and the fact that he knew how to store up goodwill. A few years later, in the presidential nomination race, he would come up against Sheward, uh, one of his rivals. And Sheward would always talk about the Trojan horse of slavery. If we let slavery enter to the Western states, it will take hold on the whole continent. Now, most of us in this call know what the Trojan horse is. We know that the Greeks snuck inside it and they penetrated Troy. We know this because we've either had read a book at school or because we've seen the film with Brad Pitt. In 1858, a normal person, a tanner, a farmer, a butcher, they've got no idea what a Trojan horse is. This is typical jargon of an of a educated man trying to convince fellow educated people. And not just educated, but classically educated. In other words, it was stupid. Now, Lincoln, on the other hand, had been brought up remarkably poor. He lost his mother when he was 11 and he was close to his mother. His sister then helped him raise her, helped to raise Lincoln. She died about 10 years later, giving birth to a stillborn son. The tragedy that, that shrouded Lincoln's life was unbelievable, but I think that gave him the deep empathy to understand normal working people. He spoke of a house divided. This was taken from the Bible of St. Matthew. Now, what that means is many people would have picked this up in Sunday school or at church, but practically lots of people would have built their own houses and they understand practically that if the foundation splits, the thing is going to fall over. Lincoln's way with words and the way he understood people built up this uh, network. And it's from this network, which was a key source of his resilience in 1858 and again in 1860, when he would eventually win the presidential nomination and then the presidency itself. So it's very important to think of resilience as not just your cognitive skills, not just your ability to reframe, but also your ability to build a support ne network around you. I mentioned it earlier, Lincoln had good stress management. The Chicago Daily Press had said he has an equable nature and a mental constitution that is never off balance. This was not PR, Lincoln was calm and he was collected. Uh, and this stood him in good stead when it came to leadership and when it came to his own personal resilience. OK, in 1858, something else was happening. Uh, over in New York, a young or a baby, Theodore Roosevelt, was being born. If we fast forward 26 years, we find Roosevelt on the floor of the um, uh, Albany State Legislature in New York State. He received the news, he was only 26, he was only a young man. He received the wonderful news that he was to be, or he was the father of a baby girl. They called her Alice. Unfortunately, within moments, a second telegram came ordering him to return home. Upon returning home, he was met on the front of his house by his brother and his brother had told him, there is a curse on this house, mother is dying, and Alice, also the name of his wife, is dying too. Within 12 hours, his 49-year-old mother would die. She passed away from typhoid fever. It, was, it had been misdiagnosed as a bad flu or a bad pneumonia. 12 hours later, his wife Alice would die in his arms. Uh, she had a kidney disease that had been masked from the pregnancy. The following day, Roosevelt made a single journal entry a large black cross and the single sentence, the light has gone out of my life. This, what happened next was a, a, a very brief return to public life, but in his grief, uh, Roosevelt made a series of political blunders and, and within uh, a, a couple of months, he actually retired from public life and moved to a ranch in Dakota. Now, this precipitated an epic transformation, and I mean epic transformation in Roosevelt. He had been quite a frail and, and in some ways spoiled young man. Uh, so physically, he was not particularly imposing. 
But on the ranch in Dakota, he volunteered for the work uh, that the other cowboys did. He went shooting, he went hunting, despite the fact that he had uh, poor vision. And this is what he said at the time. When he got to Dakota, there were all kinds of things that he was afraid of. Grizzly bears, mean horses, gunfighters. His strategy was to act as if he wasn't afraid. And he said, by acting like I wasn't afraid, eventually I stopped being afraid. This would become known as uh, Roosevelt's process for practicing fearlessness. So while he was putting on the physical weight, psychologically he was changing too. The third part of the transformation was a complete philosophical U-turn. So Roosevelt had been born to greatness, a rich family, uh, a political family, a political dynasty. He saw where the Senate was. He maybe even saw the White House and he fully expected doors to continuously open for him. It was destiny that defined a man's life. Well, on that fateful day in uh, uh, February, uh, this completely and utterly changed Roosevelt's perspective. Fortune, he said, Lady Fortune, the Roman god of luck, this is what dictates a man or a woman's life. And reacting to fortune, this would be Roosevelt's approach. This goes a long way to explain what happened next. Oh, sorry, I've, I've got a mix up in my slides. Very sorry, people. Um, excuse me. Um, so, so Roosevelt's philosophical U-turn is what would explain what happened next. Because on his return to public life after two years uh, in Dakota, eventually he would sleep again and his depression would lift. When he returned to public life, he was heavier, his voice was deeper, and he went on really what could only de be described as an epic job hop. So this is a cartoon from 1910 that shows the many public faces of Theodore Roosevelt. Well, um, what did he do? <laughs> what happened? Well, he, he took jobs, first of all, leading the Civil Service Commission. Then he led the New York uh, Police Department. Then he led the Navy. But the Navy position is something that he retired or he resigned from in order to go and fight in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. His family didn't want to do it. The Navy job was a high status job, a high paying job. And obviously fighting a war could lead very much, you know, had very much the potential for him to, you know, to die. Anyway, he did it anyway. And it was like he still needed to prove he was as tough as the other cowboys and as tough as the other men by showing he could fight. It must have looked extremely strange to onlookers. Why is this, this, this man bouncing around like that? But given his change in philosophy, uh, or if you understand his change in philosophy, then you know why he did this. So Kearns Goodwin had said of Roosevelt, everything became a test of character for him. He saw these as crucible moments to test his endurance, to test his character. Uh, he would leave nothing in reverse. He believed that his life could end at any moment and circumstances could come flying down on him exactly like they did that day in February. He left nothing in reserve and he left nothing to chance. This explains why he did what he did. Unbelievably, uh, after returning from the, uh, the, the war, uh, where he led a battalion known as Roosevelt's Roughnecks, he went to run on, as the VP for William McKinley. Now, the vice presidency, even back then, was not a particularly prestigious job. He, th he thought about it, he wasn't sure he wanted to do it, and eventually thought, you know, given his philosophy, see every post as a crucible moment, see everything you do as something to learn from, he did it. Well, true to uh, Roosevelt's philosophy of fate, 194 days after McKinley won the presidency, he was shot in an assassination attempt. Within a day, he was dead, and Roosevelt, aged only 42, became the youngest president the American the USA has ever had. Cairns Goodwin says this. She says there are no black and whites in leadership and there are, you can't like condense leadership into sound bites or heuristics. She said, with the exception of Theodore Roosevelt, this is what he did everywhere he went, hit the ground running, consolidate control, when attacked, counterattack. And when all of your political capital is spent and you feel you can't move the task forward, look for a way out and seek your next crucible moment. 
What does this teach us about leadership and the psychology of resilience? Well, there's a few things, and actually they start to overlap with what we saw with Lincoln. Roosevelt was well connected. He had money and a third of his inheritance he actually spent on building the ranch in Dakota. He left his daughter uh, with his sister, Baby. She raised the child. He, he, in fact, could never speak much of his first wife. Even in his, even in his biography and his autobiography, he never mentioned his wife to Alice. So whereas Lincoln had come to terms with the losses of his sister and his mother, Theodore Roosevelt never truly came to terms with the loss of his wife and his mother in that day. He had a support network. This meant he could play cowboy in Dakota. It, this matters. He had a well-connected family, so when he returned from public life, he could draw resilience from them. Doors would open for him. But nevertheless, he also had a tremendous work ethic. He believed that uh, time was limited, and so he wasted none of it. Lincoln had an, obs uh, had an epic work ethic. And if you look at, back to Lincoln when he was bouncing back in 58, what he was doing, he was taking his reframing skills and he was working immediately, firing letters out and planning his next move. In my opinion, work ethic is a huge uh, part of leadership and it's a huge part of resilience. They were both autodidacts. Now, this may seem strange because Roosevelt was educated. As I said, he came from a good family. But, but he had no experience. He had no education in experience. So when they became adults, Lincoln saw the one thing he didn't have, books or uh, more traditional learning. So all through his adult life, Lincoln was reading, right? Roosevelt was doing the opposite. Roosevelt sought out what he didn't have in childhood, experiences. So even though they were, they were very, very different, they were both autodidacts. They both taught themselves, but through very different mechanisms. Lincoln through his books and Theodore Roosevelt through the self-constructed crucible events. They also suffered tremendous grief. The death of Lincoln's mother when he was 11 almost certainly gave him the deep empathy he would need to tackle the house divided uh, talks against Stephen Douglas. Roosevelt said himself, I would never have played cowboy in Dakota. Uh, I would have never become president had I not played cowboy in Dakota. He would have never have played cowboy if his mother and sister hadn't have died that day. So, I want us to take a step back for just one moment and talk about grief and experience and its relationship to leadership. Modern studies show that 30% of our leadership ability or characteristics is actually genetic, 30%. The 70% variance comes from our environment, specifically our developmental experiences in childhood and early adulthood. So to understand what this means, our weight and our height are about 80% inherited and a 20% environmental, usually to do with how much food we have access to. So the variance in leadership is wide. Now, Thomas uh, Chimura Premusic, he says this, it's the key development experiences that shape people's leadership potential very early in life and definitely before they arrive in the office. This is an extremely important insight because companies spend millions on leadership training, most of it ineffective. And that's because if those key developmental experiences haven't happened, you could no, no more make somebody lead in that sense than you could make me super skinny, right? It's too late now. At my size, I'm, you, can't make, you can't shrink me, nor can you stretch me. And it's in exactly the same mechanism by which we cannot automatically train people to become leaders. If we cast our mind back to the earlier talk about Jenny, what did the trauma of the cloud native transformation do? It was her developmental experience. It awoke a leadership in her in exactly the same way that nutrition would awaken our length. I believe these key development exper de developmental experiences are what lead to later leadership. And in fact, we believe this so much at Container Solutions we deliberately seek out difficult projects or, or projects that stretch us, and we want our, our uh, emerging leaders to, to go through these projects in their 20s, in their 30s, because we believe it will give them the foundation to be good leaders later in their 40s. 
So those experiences that Roosevelt and Lincoln went through are crucial. And I do believe through uh, Thomas Chimuru of Premusic's research that actually we can start to look practically what does this mean for the design of our organizations. And by the way, our secret weapon is we focus less on training and more on selection. So I'm not saying we neglect leadership training, but leadership selection is absolutely key. And actually, if you've only got a thousand pounds to spend, you're better off spending it on selection, right? Because lead, leaders are developed and forged in earlier experiences. Okay, we're coming slowly to the end uh, uh, of our president. We just need to talk about uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because within Roosevelt, we see an extremely important leadership trait, namely the willingness to experiment. Um, let's talk about FDR. FDR, he was only distantly related to Roosevelt, but actually FDR had two massive families he belonged to, the Delanos and the Roosevelts, huge American dynasties, and FDR, exactly like Theodore Roosevelt, his life was preordained. Doors opened constantly for him. Many people who met him in his 20s thought he was quite superficial. He didn't necessarily have a great work ethic. Uh, he was just another rich boy whose life was going to uh, uh, unfold in front of him, but really without much effort from him. His social skills were outstanding. He was well socialised and people felt at ease around him. What happened to this social, superficial, callow young man between his 20s and his 50s? He would go on to be the single most radical US president in history. He would forever change the relationship between the state and citizen. He's the only president that had three terms. They changed the laws after that. He led the US through the Great Depression and the Second World War into the nuclear age. What on earth happened? Well, something did happen. Um, in August of 1921, at his summer retreat, Roosevelt, or FDR, I should say, was feeling sick. His antidote to feeling sick was exercise. So on that day of feeling sick, he went running, he went swimming, his mood or his, his feelings had still not lifted. So he said to his kids, come on, let's race to our favorite picnic spot. Um, eventually that evening, he fell into a deep, deep fever. Uh, the doctors didn't know what it was. At first, the diagnosis was incorrect. The fever led to almost full paralysis, including the loss of uh, bodily functions. And eventually, FDR would be diagnosed with having polio. The doctors uh, uh, were extremely concerned. FDR was an optimist, very wishful in his thinking. And they were worried, uh, well, they were convinced he would never walk again. They were at one point thought his bodily functions wouldn't return, but actually they did return after seven weeks. He still had ambitions to, to hold public office. So they were trying to break the news to him that, you know, uh, forget about public office, you're, you're never going to walk again. So they tiptoed around him. But within FDR's optimism was almost a secret weapon because what happened next is really quite extraordinary. So FDR and his family had earlier been through a crucible moment. His father had become paralyzed because of a heart attack. FDR, his mother and his siblings basically pretended like everything was okay. They didn't want to upset the old man. They didn't want to dishearten him. Um, uh, and so they kept up a brave face. Now, Kearns Goodwin, the historian, basically said they deceived him. So this optimism was partially based in deception. And she says that this ability to deceive and this willingness to deceive was actually part of the reason that FDR could make forward motion. Because as well as deceiving those around him in this very, very terrible illness at the beginning, he also deceived himself. And his feigned optimism and his pretend optimism would eventually give way to real optimism. What happened next is FDR would, would, would jump with joy for every tiny change that he had, every increment of change. He would use trial and error and he would, he would celebrate when he succeeded. This would be the blueprint for how many years later he would pull America out of the Great Depression. Now, the next three years, the next part of his recovery was actually astounding. He relied almost completely on three separate people. Uh, Louis Howe on the left, his private secretary or his assistant. 
uh, uh, Missy Lahand in the middle, his private secretary, who would, who would go on to become known as the second uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, and Eleanor Roosevelt on the right. Eleanor would take FDR's place in public, in New York, in Washington, making sure that everybody knew he was still uh, in the game. He was, he was retreating right now, but he was going to come back. She herself had good leadership skills. She inspired loyalty. She could set goals. She could build coalitions. Despite the fact that she caught FDR having an affair, she seems to have forgiven him, and they then struck up a more practical political partnership. Now, for the summers, FDR would go to Florida because he could swim in the sea and it was warm. Missy Lahand would help him in the mornings when he was depressed. She'd help to pick him up. She would host air drinks and cocktail parties. Um, and he would confide in her and her alone his absolute worst fears. And Louis Howe essentially abandoned his own family, including children, moved in with Roosevelt and would be his sort of right and left hand man. What on earth was it that Roosevelt did that inspired such deep loyalty uh, in these people? Because that is what he did. And it's really important because in my opinion, cognitive skills, the ability to reframe, to bounce back, to remain optimistic are key to resilience, but so too is your ability to build a network. Let's start to unpack FDR and see if we can answer that question as to why and how he inspired such loyalty. So first of all, he was comfortable with deception. Who would have thought that a politician was happy to deceive? He faked it until he could make it. He had his ex support network, part one, a hugely rich family. So uh, after the first couple of years of convalescence, uh, Roosevelt went on to open up a huge uh, center at, at Warm Springs, and it was for him and his fellow polios. And the trial and error he, approach he took to his own improvements, he would teach them. And he said to them, hey, just because we're, we're crippled doesn't mean we shouldn't have fun. So as well as exercises and meditation and stretching, they also had cocktail parties. Once again, we see the, the FDR optimism and the willingness to do trial and error working in Warm Springs, where he built an absolutely cutting edge center. He did that because he had money. So he could build his own support network. And very importantly, experimentation and optimism, the absolute key to success here at Container Solutions and scaling any business. Optimism is not wishful thinking. It's the belief that given what you've, the hand you've been dealt, you can get through the other side. And now, finally, the social skills that I really want to do a bit of a deep dive on. So one of the things I teach my emerging and my colleagues at Container Solutions and we teach our emerging leaders is this, the spectrum of assertiveness. So this, this comes from research. We didn't make this up. Uh, we did visualize it, but it's a, it's a summary of uh, uh, modern leadership research. At two ends of the spectrum, you've got unhealthy ranges. The very assertive person is a bully uh, and the very unassertive person is a doormat. I'm not talking about the toxic ends of the spectrum. Within the, the middle of the spectrum, we have a healthy range of behaviors. The moderate leader or the moderately assertive person builds relationships, builds trust, builds collaboration, and helps with conflict resolution. Just last week, somebody gave uh, one of our leaders a high five and said, thank you to so-and-so for facilitating trust. And I was like, boom, there you go. Moderately assertive leadership in action. The highly assertive leader can go quickly and he's good in a crisis, but does so that the, the, the traction and the progress, the quick progress, comes so at the cost of relationships. In a complex setup of a scaling business, a cloud native transformation, or in politics, you need this moderate assertiveness. And I believe FDR was brilliant at give and take. His, his affair with Roosevelt, uh, his affair uh, he had uh, when he was married to Eleanor, Unbelievable the way they unpack that and they discuss that, although some historians say she never actually forgave him. But nevertheless, this ability to build relationships had given Roosevelt a chance to build this trifecta of La Hand, uh, Howe, uh, and Eleanor, and that had essentially fueled or enabled him to return to public life. Now, what happens next is absolutely remarkable. He was asked by uh, he was asked by a candidate to endorse him for the Democratic presidential nomination. 
This would mean Roosevelt would have to walk to the stage, turn a full 90 degrees, walk to the rostrum, and then, and then uh, um, uh, address the DNC. 12,000 people. Only earlier, uh, he'd slipped on his crutches in a lobby in New York, and true, you know, true to his character, whilst laid out on the floor, said, nothing to see here, don't worry, I'm totally fine. He couldn't walk. At this point, he had the body of a, of a weightlifter. He was, he was massively strong. So with braces and crutches, he could kind of drag himself. A lot of people in the Democratic Party said he's finished. And they called him cripple, which is obviously a tremendously you know, a mean thing to, to say. He practiced in his house. He gripped his son's arm so tightly that he bruised his forearm as he practiced, practiced, practiced. When the conference came about, he appeared on stage with his crutches, slowly made the first march, turned the 90 degrees, slowly made it to the rostrum, handed off his crutches, took a hold of the podium, looked up and smiled. And when he did so, 12,000 people erupted in applause. He was back. He'd walked, he'd fought his way back into public life. Um, what people don't know is those sat in the front rows could see FDR's knuckles were white. He was shaking and he was sweating and he was in agony. He was in agony throughout his whole speech. So regardless of, his, of how sport he might one day have been, he'd become a truly tough, uh, persistent uh, uh, person. And I love that story. Um, so much later on, incremental gains, experimentation, optimism would be exactly the blueprint that FDR would use during the Great Depression. And the amount of times I've pulled this quote out at Container Solutions, we can't count the amount of times this has been brought out. The country needs, and unless I'm mistaken, it demands bold, persistent experimentation. It's common sense to try something, and if it doesn't work, admit it, and then try something else. This was Roosevelt's, FDR's political legacy. And I believe he learned that starting in that terrible August uh, in 1924. Is it all misery? Do we have to lose our parents and our partners? And do we have to lose the use of our legs in order to become leaders? Um, not, not fully, people don't need to die. But what we've seen at Container Solutions is that hardships provide humility and perspectives. So certainly as an older person, I'm 44 now, as a man who has a family, who's, who has ridden the highs and lows of trying to start a business, I can empathize with people who are 10 years younger than me. The frustrations they feel that their career is stalling, uh, the annoyance that they can't get work to be done. Uh, if you're an engineer who's moved into leadership, the frustration you feel because a person is not a machine, uh, I can empathize and I can help create perspective. So hardships are important, but they're not the only part of our leadership model. What, what Theodore Roosevelt taught us was this, assignments and projects are fantastic ways to gaining confidence, to become independent and to gain knowledge. What's the first thing you do on a new project? Well, if you're like me, you start Googling and reading books. I, I'm reading team topologies. I've never read this before, but it's because I've got a problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, so assignments and, 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 and projects that have a beginning and an end are brilliant teachers. Now, what happens is this. Many of us come from university and we get our first jobs and we go on an epic streak of success. The resilience that we create and the confidence we create, if we're not careful, they change into arrogance and toughness, right? If we become too tough, we don't care about other people. If our confidence gets too high, we become arrogant. And the longer your streak of successful projects goes on, the bigger the fall when hardship will eventually pay you a visit. And it will. For successful engineers, often the very first career hardship is when you realize people are not machines. So you, your, your epic success as an engineer is confronted by your first epic failures in leadership. This is part of the process. So at Container Solutions, we care about humility and perspective. We care about confidence and resilience and relationships. But there's an intersection where these things uh, come together and experience can help give you all of those things. So we're not against training, definitely not,
but experience and projects and life experience does help you to become a more rounded leader. We've seen that definitely in the case of Lincoln, his humility was off the charts. And we saw with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, those crucible projects he created for himself brought him great experience because eventually as the president, he would have to negotiate and navigate an extremely difficult crisis, which was namely the coal strike. And all of his previous experiences had prepared him for that moment. What does it mean for us? Most people in America at least, experience Abraham Lincoln at first by visiting or seeing it on television, the Lincoln Memorial. Lincoln is a huge statue, a 16 foot man. But the hope is this, he wasn't born 16 foot. He grew that way through his own crucible experiences. And even at the beginning of the Civil War, his leadership was not complete. He was indecisive. He drew too much uh, from other people. He wasn't able to make decisions. And often he compromised. One of his secretaries, uh, one of his uh, uh, members of the cabinet said, we need 100,000 men. The other one said, we need 50,000. Lincoln split the difference and said, just send 75. This is not leadership. Uh, but he learned on the job. He grew to become 16 feet. This is really important. Cast your mind back to Jenny on the Cloud Native Transformation. And in fact, cast your mind back to your own experiences. You know where you are. You suffer something really difficult, a divorce, uh, a sick child, um, a, a difficult project where your self-esteem and confidence is shattered. And in that period, you hate it. As soon as you leave that period, you're like a new person. You, you have grown an inch, just like Lincoln did. So the hope is that these experiences teaches us. It worked for Lincoln and it will work for all of us. Now, if you want to become more resilient, um, of course, practice fearlessness like Theodore Roosevelt, but actually get fit. So being physically fit and walking and cycling and jogging, they change your perspective. So the Roosevelt's both became strong. Lincoln was physically a very imposing man uh, because he'd had a whole life of, of physical labor. Um, but exercise gives you perspective. A high red blood count helps you concentrate more. So when you're leading and when the shit hits the fan, you need to be calm. So typically the stronger I feel physically, the easier it is for me to lead. Work ethic, nothing works if we don't. You can build up your work ethic. So it's fine, maybe right now, you know, uh, uh, you're not the most organized person. Maybe you haven't learned to judge the most strategic from non-strategic tasks. You can work on this. Uh, David Allen wrote a great book called Getting Things Done. Uh, there's the Pomodoro Technique. I've written a book that touches on this. It is possible to become more effective and stretch your work and your ability to do work for longer in exactly the same way that we can run longer distances with practice. A lot of people come to me who want to lead but don't want to work. I can't help them. If you don't work, you can't lead. It's, it's a very, very simple, simple calculus. Now, journaling is very important. The, the ex-presidents, the dead presidents, didn't have Slack and they didn't have the internet and they didn't have WhatsApp. So what they had to do then was write letters. Obviously they wrote drafts and threw them away. Now Lincoln used to talk about hot letters. This, was, this is a letter he'd write and he would absolutely annihilate the recipient and then he would never send it. And now our generation, I'm afraid, we've got no processes for gathering our thoughts collecting our, our words and compartmentalizing things in our heads. So we should journal. Now, many people at CS journal and in the journal, you unpack your feelings, you try to reframe. And from a leadership perspective, the next time a problem pops around, you've got the words at the tip of your tongue. So I love doing webinars, I love it. I love educating and I love being educated, but selfishly preparing for webinars help me lead my organization better because it gives me access to a vocabulary and mental models that I can use when I'm doing coalition building. You must live. I know this is, this is trite advice and maybe you don't need to hear it from me right now, in which case you can tell me to shut up, but you must live. If you've had your heart broken, try to find the courage to love again. Uh, you've got to invite life in because it's coming anyway. And the downside of of living and engaging with life on its terms is that you'll cry, you'll also laugh, and you'll suffer, 
but it helps you to become a rounded, fully grown, emotionally mature human being. Um, I, I'll be true, I'll be honest, I kept life at bay, at least until I was 35. <laughs> when I finally let it come in, I started to grow as a person. And I've had a few, there's been a few tears in the last few years, uh, but I'm a stronger person for it and I've probably got a wider uh, perspective than I used to have. Um, that's more or less it for the uh, webinar. I do feel it's really important that I acknowledge um, uh, the lessons of experience which I drew heavily from. Uh, Doris Cairns Goodwin, a uh, fantastic historian. I've read a few of her books, but I, I basically really took the stories of the presidents from that book. And then the EQ leader with regards to assertiveness and the assertiveness spectrum. So in summary, uh, yeah, resilience is to do with reframing situations in real time. And the more you practice, the easier it becomes. It's partially to do with being fit uh, and it's partially to do with becoming humble and having perspective, which typically comes from hardships. Um, yeah, and, and that's basically it. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, I hope there's some questions that we can, uh, we can start to unpack now. And as we do that, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can listen and see you all uh, in full colour. Well, thank you, Jamie. Those were some really awesome personas in those stories. There were a couple of questions actually for today. So uh, first one, which aspects of leadership are genetic and which can be developed by training? Is personality or temperament a big part of leadership? I actually cannot answer that question. I'm annoyed that I didn't see that one coming. Um, I, I, I don't recall. I can check that and follow up. I will check that for myself. Um, is temperament a part of leadership? In my opinion, though, so, so just full disclosure, I am not an occupational psychologist. I, I'm an, I teach myself this stuff. So this is my perspective as, a, as an executive and not a, a member of the, the medical profession. In my experience and in my understanding, the temperament of Lincoln, that equitable nature, also not highly assertive, very rarely would he act like an autocrat, is fantastic for complex situations. Some of us, for example, are naturally moderate in our assertiveness. And in my experience of scaling a business and um, um, cloud native transformation, this is a fantastic temperament to have. Uh, Container Solutions, other founder, Pini Resnick, I think sl slots into that. Although as, as he gets older, he's getting more bossy. Uh, I think he slots into that. So I do think temperament's important. As a younger person, I was more assertive and, and less willing to compromise than I am now. I'm a better leader now, but my willingness and ability to fight when it matters is extremely useful in a crisis. So temperament matters, uh, but it's to do with the situation. So, so if you want to start a business with no money, I'm a pretty good person to come and speak to. If you've got to the next stage and you're trying to be more collaborative, then, for example, Pinny's leadership skills would be very useful. So it's temperament, but in relation to the situation. Now, to further answer that question, in my opinion, there is no space for bullying or for uh, low assertiveness. Bullies always say, I'm passionate, right? But it's interesting that they're only passionate about being right and they're not passionate about other people or the community. So you've got to watch out for that bogus leadership when people tell you, I'm very assertive, I know what I want, uh, I'm a very passionate person. To me, this rings uh, alarm bells uh, every day of the week. And that temperament, uh, or that authoritarian temperament, will never ever work in leadership. You can only get short term gains with authoritarian leadership. The authoritarian, he says things or she says things that other people are thinking. You attack migrants, you pick on team in marketing, you can create a coalition based on rottenness, but it won't last long and it's not real leadership. Great. Does that, does that answer the question for the person who asked, asked it? Uh, let's see. Um, Henry will let us know, but I believe so. <laughs> Okay, and another, any more questions? Yes. Uh, in regards of resilience, how can I seek experiences? Well, that depends how 
does it depend how old you are? Well, I suppose, <laughs> yeah, maybe. So one of the things I teach, I try to teach, and one of the rules that I lived my life by is the earning and learning principle. So for example, as you are developing in your career, you should always favor uh, learning over earning, earning money. So a lot of people in their 20s, they take, they take big salaries, but they're constrained. And unfortunately, once you get to a certain age, you, you don't learn as quickly. So certainly I would advise anybody young to seek out a company that lets you learn. And at, so for example, I worked at Accenture. Accenture were brilliant. If you're good enough, then you're old enough. So when I was 25, they let me do what I like. Huge multi-million dollar projects. This was my crucible moment, right? Everything we do at Container Solutions started 19 years ago at Accenture. Oh my God, 19 years ago? Oh fuck, it is 19 years. <laughs> wow, oh wow, that's a realization. So, so seek companies that will support you uh, and then do mad things. If, you, if, you, if you're single or if you don't have too many responsibilities, look for a project. You can volunteer, uh, find somebody you admire and ask them, ask if you can shadow them. But absolutely prioritize your learning and seek those experiences out. And if you're not scared, then you're not, then the experience is not stretching you. So let your emotions, your fear be your guide. If you're a little bit scared, you're probably on the right track. Cool, thank you, Jamie. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have today. Oh. Yeah, it's oh, very good. 12 o'clock on the dot, at least in Amsterdam, I mean. So I would like to thank you so much for your time and everybody else as well for joining today. Uh, sorry, I cut you off. Okay, um, so occasionally this, this runs over, sometimes they run over, but you wanna wrap this up dead on time? Mm, yeah, because yeah. there were a few people already leaving uh, yeah. that uh, they had to go for the next meeting. So Very cool. Okay, well, you're, you're all welcome. Thank you, Teresa, for managing the time very strictly and managing all the questions. Um, no worries. Any final words from you, Teresa? I've lost my connection. Any final words, Teresa? Oh, sorry. I think I lost my connection as well. Uh, no, I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, the time. And we are looking forward to seeing you for our next uh, event, our series of WTFs. So, and big applause to you, Jamie. This uh, webinar was really amazing. Well, from, from me and everybody in the webinar to you, Teresa, for organizing, making sure everything's on time, every time. We also thank you and we're super grateful. And uh, we, we, I look forward to doing this again soon. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.